All right, I am live. I've got Autisticus Spasticus. What is it? Spasticus? Mm -hmm. I'll call you Spaz. Uh, yeah, Autisticus Spasticus. And we're going to discuss or have a chat here. I'm going to interview him. Uh, we're going to talk about antinatalism. I, I've, you know, I recently started looking into this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, it's, it's intriguing to me. I, uh, mm -hmm. I, wa I started watching that that channel um do not watch yeah and that is some fucking grim shit mm. um watching animal life getting eaten alive on film is while while music's playing like mm. like some pretty um opera song or whatever you know uh, classical music and then mm, yeah. wildlife getting eaten alive uh, yeah it's like something out of apocalypse now isn't it it's terrible yeah, it was a, it was, it, well, I'm kind of a, how do I say this? I, I'm kind of a, I'm drawn to, to morbid stuff. Mm. Um, I am as well, but um, it, it always works out badly for me, though. Like um, it's all, what do it comes, it, it, it comes at a cost, you know. I mean, finding out what I did about, um, what happened to the Germans in World War Two? I mean, I'm I'm glad that I found out about it because it's something that everyone should know about. But at the same time, you know, it, it has affected my life irrevocably and um, certainly damaged me mentally. I mean, I, if I if I had known, oh shit, I was muted. Sorry. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a little rough when you realize, like, life is just cold and brutal. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, I don't, Spag, I don't, I don't uh, have that, I don't have that essay um, in front of me at the moment, so I can't remember word for word what is in the video. But you, you've watched it, all of it, you say. Yeah, um, um, an indictment on life. Yes. Yeah, I did. I did listen to that. Uh, you know, Spaz, I we're kind of very um, much the opposite. So I, I'm just different. I, you know, I mm -hmm. I'm very we're very different people, and I, I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to sound offensive, but I think this conversation or this interview is a little taxing for maybe both of us. Mm -hmm. because you know we're di we're different mm -hmm. but I, I i still find this this topic this subject matter pretty uh i don't mm -hmm. know it's something it's something i think that shouldn't be i don't know people should maybe think maybe look into it a little bit it's interesting it's something mm -hmm. to maybe think about yeah i mean i i think the ethno nationalism um is a more you can do more with it. It's a more animating force. Um, whereas with AN, I think AN is the greater truth of the two, certainly the more important one. Um, but w as I say, I, I think it's sort of, I call it the final frontier for, for humanity, the final big question, you know, because we've, we've done, um, the, the ones that would precede it um, chronologically would be um, obviously the realism and relativism would be one thing. And then, of course, the God question, whether the, or not there is a God or higher purpose, that kind of thing. And once we'd answered those questions, uh, we would then ultimately be left with this one about is this existence really worth it, you know? Um, and I talked with uh, Andrew Joyce about this. Um, well, we talked about a lot of things. It was for about three months in 21 we spoke about this. Um, and he... Um, what was his conclusion? Mm, well, uh, we, uh, he said that he can't argue against AN logically because it seems to be perfectly sound. Um, what criticisms there are to be made, I've anticipated and 
uh, countered as best I can. Um, uh, he, he can't really argue against it, but he would simply have to say, I, I, I reject it simply because, you know, and then not provide a reason. It's simply that, um, you know, he, he's invested in obviously white nationalism and he already has, I can't remember what he told me, if it was three or four children he has. Um, and he he explained that he's someone who, uh, if I remember rightly, um, since he was a teenager, he's never really been without female company for any great length of time. Um, and I thought, well, I didn't say it, but I thought, well, lucky for you, Andrew, but we aren't all that uh, fortunate in our endeavours, are we? You know, And I think it's very hard for people who have had a charmed life, who have had things come relatively easy to them. Well, Very Spaz, well, Spaz, I wanted to ask you that. I mean, and I hate to interrupt, but mm -hmm. I mean, um, you're hanging out. You want to you want to do a stream, and I, I'm mm -hmm. a I'm a nobody. I have almost no following, and I, I have mm -hmm. a very small channel. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if you were maybe cooler or better mm -hmm. looking or had higher status in life uh mm -hmm. i mean would that not prevent you from ever even being mm -hmm. here talking with me about this and stuff well i don't know i mean um i think people are more likely to come into contact with an if they have very miserable lives if they've had very bad experiences um, although it is possible, I have seen a few of them, people who have had relatively fortunate lives, and yet they they still embrace AN on a purely logical ground because they understand that uh, even the richest, most wealthiest, healthy person could still have a child who suffers unbearably in life from any number of diseases, could be raped or murdered. And of course, you know, there's no amount of money or good luck in the world which is going to make you immortal or you know um stall the deaths of your loved ones it's something that we all share in as they always call death the great equalizer um, because we all we all end up in the same place and in that way it really is um death is a very egalitarian thing in that we all have an equal share in it. Um, and I've, I've never been convinced by people who say that we should not fear death. You know, they say, oh, as that quote I mentioned before, Carl Sagan, when he said, um, oh, uh, once we regard death as a natural process, you know, we understand it, um, then it becomes less frightening. I, I felt like there was some part of that equation that was missing. I thought, well, Mr. Sagan, whoever said that death wasn't natural? I mean, I, I don't know where he was going with that. Um, no one ever said death wasn't natural. So I, I don't see how it's some great revelation that he, he tried to foist on us there. He seemed to be speaking as if it was a great revelation. But I don't see that it was and it certainly didn't make me feel any better you know and a lot of the times they say things like you know misery loves company and uh, the fact that we're all going to die somehow uh, they say that as if somehow it makes should make it better it doesn't make it better for me i don't feel any better um you know about my own death just thinking that everyone else is going to die as well uh, you know, if anything, that seems to um, compound the um, awfulness of it. Yeah, well, it sucks being alone or by yourself or thinking you're the only one, right? Mm -hmm. So there is some merit to what that that cliche statement, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, it, as I say, I think it's very hard for people who have had good fortune in life to um, 
see it from the perspective of those who haven't, you know. Um, the, as you know, this happens sometimes where I'm talking and I forget what I was going to say. Um, well, I guess my, I guess what I was trying to get at is if you were more popular, more people would be listening to you. But if mm -hmm. you were popular, you wouldn't be here. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? You I mean you said Andrew Joyce kind of fits in that mold? So I mean, does that not kind of follow? What do you mean I wouldn't be here? You mean I wouldn't be alive? No, here, as in we're having this discussion that you would be doing something else with your life. Oh yeah, and I might. Who knows? I might be then ignorant of A N, and then I would be creating more. Um, well, we, we often refer to uh, people as uh, need chasers because they're chasing these needs and wants and such like, which a lot of the time don't get satisfied. And uh, none of these needs and wants existed before they were born. So it's it's really an utterly gratuitous thing, you know? Yeah. Um. Mm. I was at a, I was at a bar a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. I had a few drinks and some dinner, and you know, I was after work and shooting, you know, having a, you know, shooting the shit, uh, chatting with my my co coworkers and stuff, you know. And mm -hmm. I got out of the bar and I'm walking to my car, and there's a bird on the on the sidewalk. You mean a human female? A bird, uh, like a like a like a flying creature. Oh right. Well, here when we say bird, we often mean a woman. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. So this bird was injured and dying, and mm -hmm. like suffering. It was it was on the sidewalk, and mm -hmm. I mean it, it made me sad. Like life is mm -hmm. life is just brutal. Like seeing mm -hmm. this pretty little creature like suffering and about to die. Mm -hmm. Like it's just a fucking. I mean, it just kind of reminds you how fucked up the world is, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, proximity to death makes us uncomfortable because we then reflect on our own mortality. Um, you know, I think that's something which, if nothing else, um, must surely haunt the mind of, you know, the serial killer. It's the thought that he, you know, eventually will end up just like his victims, you know. Um Again, coming back to death being the great equalizer. Yeah, you're not wrong. I guess that's that's uh, that's probably true. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm. Do you want to live like as long as you can? No, 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 not at all. No. Well, would it be? I don't know. How do I say this? If you really believe what you believe, what, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean or insensitive. Uh, if you really believe mm -hmm. this, why don't you just kill yourself? And I'm just, mm -hmm. that's just a question I assume you've mm -hmm. heard before. Well, I devoted a, quite a large part of the essay to that question, didn't I? Yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm. More than a little bit, I think. Yeah. I, well, to the to the people listening, what do you, what do you say to that? Just uh, your 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 rebuttal, your 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 you know, uh, come at me, bro. Like, what do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Well, death for those of us who are all alive doesn't really solve the problem. It's really it's really an extension of the problem rather than a solution to it. Um. So, my dad, Spaz, my, my father, I was a young boy, you know, I was cruising around in his pickup truck, and my dad told me, you know, son, change is good. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? My father told me that change is good many mm -hmm. years ago. What do you think about that? I think people say that because... Uh, they know there's nothing they can do about it anyway, so they have to convince themselves that it's good. I wouldn't say it's bad. I just think mm. it's reality. Um, mm. You know, when I when he said that, ever since he said that, Spaz, I I 
I didn't really, I, I almost, I reject it because most change is horrific and awful, mm -hmm. but then oh, there's, yeah. there's some things that are good or better, mm -hmm. or it's, it's like a, you know, it's, 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 it's constantly moving. It's, it's, I don't mm -hmm. know. There's, there's no way to really measure it. I mean, yeah, change sucks and I'm older now and mm -hmm. there's some things I can maybe take away that, you know, it's like, okay, that, that sucks. Cause I, you know, you, you kind of, uh, you know, romanticize the, the your, 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 your childhood, but I mean, hell I'm driving a brand new car. I mean, I couldn't mm -hmm. drive a brand new car when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So there's some things are pretty fun and neat or mm -hmm. interesting or better. Mm. Yeah. Well, there are some positive things you could focus on to, um, keep your attention while you're here for those of us who are already here we need uh, distractions and entertainment and that kind of thing um but people who don't exist yet don't have any need for it obviously so it can't be used then as a justification for their creation it's the trouble is people um they they can't they're always projecting themselves in the here and now onto these potential persons who don't have any sunk costs yet. They don't have anything invested in this life. So therefore the things that would justify the continuation of an existing life would not justify the creation of new life. What do you, uh, you know, you're an, you're an antinatalist. What do you think about someone like Elon Musk talking about a, uh, you know, the mm. wor worried, about, concerned about a birth rate? Uh, what do you think about that? Mm. Well, um, not so long ago, the um, blogger named Helian, uh, he did a piece on um, the hysteria in Japan about birth rates. And he showed, I think, quite convincingly that there's really nothing to be frightened of. If anything, um, Japan could stand to lose quite a few people because it is a very densely populated country. I've seen the way they cram the people onto the trains like sardines. Uh, it doesn't look very uh, um, appealing way of life. Um yeah, I, I think, and again, it would do, it would come down to the, you know, if people are going to be having children, which a lot of them are going to, no matter what we say, um, because it's it's an ego thing, really. Um, if they are going to do it, then they should do it with a view to um, quality over quantity, and having a as rigid and well-informed eugenic framework as they possibly can do it you know I, I see this as eugenics as being a albeit very distant second best option to an and probably the one which more people would readily uh, adopt you know even all the lefties they may hate uh, eugenics but uh, i think a lot of them would probably i might prefer that over a an depends on how much of an ego they have yeah um what do you think about people who choose um self-deletion uh, what, what are your thoughts on self-deletion um mm -hmm. do you think it should be um is it moral is it legal is it is mm -hmm. it um, just what are your thoughts i agree with the australian doctor um well i don't know if he's a doctor anymore i think he burnt his medical license in protest, um, the Australian uh, Philip Nitschke, who has said that, um, well, he believes, and I think he's right, that the um, pathologization of self-deletion uh, is ultimately Christian in origin, again. Um, that's an explanation which obviously finds favor with me. Um, and... The, the, the idea about you know saving souls and such like the, the preservation of human life at all costs i've always disagreed with the hippocratic oath 
I think you know the the imperative of a doctor should be uh, not to um, sustain life at all costs, but to prevent suffering at all costs, which of course then gives them leeway to practice euthanasia. Um, and it, I think, we should understand that people who are in that much of a desperate situation they need our help they don't need us to hinder them in what they have to do they're already going through worse hell than we could imagine the last thing they need is for all these uh, bureaucratic judicial roadblocks to be put in the way i mean think about what they're having to deal deal with they're dealing with the ultimate compromise, which is the destruction, the obliteration of the, their self, simply to make their pain end, which is, it really is the ultimate compromise you can make. Um, and, you know, we, we should take them at their word that they're in a great deal of pain and that nothing can be done because, and as society, of course, is an inherently natalist arrangement and we should accept that these casualties that exist the people who self-delete uh, they are here because of the general consensus you know our, our conceit that it is okay to reproduce it is at the very least neutral if not outright good as elon musk would say so we have a duty if nothing else to ease these people into their transition to death. Uh, of course, it really is a crime that they were ever created in the first place. You know, prevention is better than cure, as they say. And if the cure in this case is them having to take their own lives, then obviously that in itself is a huge um, uh, um, endorsement for AM. Okay, yeah, um, uh, where do I want to go with this? Um, have you heard, I mean, I'm sure you've heard the term, um, no pain, no gain. Mm -hmm. There was a, there what was is, one, of, there is, was is there one. About that? One of one of the quotes I read out towards the end of the essay from directly from Benatar's books deals with exactly that um, conundrum. Um, I don't know where to go with this. It's like it's it's God. It's it's a tough subject, uh, and I'm not think, I'm not equipped to talk about this this uh, yeah. <laughs> this this particular yeah. subject matter. I don't think, but I, well, I, th I think I think I I probably answered just about every question someone unfamiliar with AN could possibly ask in that essay. I mean that that is why I wrote it. So I wanted to cover every aspect of what I, what a newcomer might ask about us particularly f in my case i wrote it with um a view to how a dissident right person might uh, feel about it is it maybe fair to i can't i kind of want to live uh spaz like i, I want to live long like i don't want to die like dying is mm -hmm. gonna be bad so i want to like maybe prolong that mm -hmm. and have mm -hmm. like uh happiness enjoy some some parts of life mm -hmm. um now that you're, now maybe, that you're, well maybe yeah. you're maybe you're stuck in your own head like maybe go do mm -hmm. instead mm -hmm. of just be maybe you need to do things do mm -hmm. stuff well that's the great um problem of the human condition i think that we are all ultimately alone and unreachable in that we are inside our own minds and we are trapped there and for some people it's an absolute ha agony and i can't think of anything that would uh, justify 
one person suffering like that, let alone the many that do, you know. Um, as I say, there, there are, um, there's no non-existent people who yearn to be born, obviously, but there are plenty of existing people who wish that they never had been. I think they really are the, um, if, if no one else, they should be the arbiters of whether the game of life is worth it. You know, only the. Are you the are you saying that that out that outweighs the existence of life, or or life? Are you saying it? It's it like over uh, overpowers, or it's it's mm. outweighing outweighing that? I'm mm. not so sure. I'm saying that's where all of the moral weight is located. Yeah. I mean, it's not a fucking... I mean, it's kind of a fair argument. I'm not going to lie. I, mm -hmm. um, and this is why I say it. Ha I feel it has a lot in common with the dissident right in that the, the answers to these questions, they are correct, but they are unpalatable. Is there is there grace in going extinct? Um, I don't know if you'd say grace. I don't think there's any harm in it because we're all destined to suffer a personal extinction anyway. Our own lives come to an end um, and the lives of our descendants. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it doesn't matter if it happens in a hundred years or a hundred million years. The end goal is what you must um judge uh, the worthiness of the project on i use that analogy a lot about the the beautiful mathematical equation but if it ends in zero then that does really nullify everything that came before it you have to take the long view and see uh judge what is at the end of the tunnel Hey, so Spaz, I'm here's. I mean, I'm. We're all kind of just going all over. I got a bunch of questions. I'll just kind of throw them at you, and you can, you know, tell me what you think. I guess. Mm -hmm. Um. The next life has a better life. Is that not a good reason to be pro natalist? Do you mean an afterlife? The next generation. My, ch mm -hmm. if I were to have children, my, my child, like, I'll mm -hmm. give you an example. I'll give you an example. Um, mm -hmm. like I, I have a higher standard of living than my granddaddy, mm -hmm. my grandpa. Mm -hmm. my I, I covered, I covered that in the essay. Don't you remember? Well, yeah, I understand that, but we're, we're here live and people are listening. Mm -hmm. and oh, right. yeah, they yeah. want to hear what you think. And I'm oh, asking, okay. I'm asking you that this life, mm -hmm. you know, life, life itself, um, mm -hmm. you know, when I procreate, the, the progression of life mm -hmm. where they have a the, the new generation is going to have a more prosperous kind of less of a struggle than mm -hmm. the previous generation so is that not an mm -hmm. argument to be pro natalist well no because those future beneficiaries do not currently exist and have no interest in being brought into existence um but the you know it, it's it's sort of um it's it's like a pyramid scheme it's saying that the intermediate generations that suffer horribly their suffering is worth it in order to benefit people who don't yet exist and have no interest in being created. And it is it's a form of, of legitimization. And, you know, for those of us who are alive right now and have suffered horribly as I have, it, 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 it is insulting as an argument, really, because it's saying that our suffering is, is worth it. We're the dispensable intermediary generation who doesn't really matter. someone in the chat they asked about kaczynski um mm -hmm. are you familiar with the theory of power process mm -hmm. kaczynski wrote that very long um manifesto um a friend of mine american lady with four children uh tried to get me to read it a few years ago i think i got about a quarter way through his manifesto and i just couldn't read anymore because it was so meandering and I thought quite dull and didn't seem to be coming to any kind of a point and I, I just kind of gave up. Uh, 
I, I did find it quite boring. Some things in there were, I think, were interesting, but now I, I've heard people speaking positively of Kaczynski within the dissident right, and I've heard some people speak critically of him. I, I think Keith Woods not long ago uh, did a, a long video where he argued uh, mostly against Kaczynski's ideas. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about Keith Woods. He's okay. I don't, mm. I don't hate the guy. I don't, I don't necessarily mm. uh, worship him or anything. But I, I'm glad mm. he's out there, kind of doing his shtick. Um, he's he's putting out, I don't know, I guess better content than some. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think he had a debacle with the uh, with someone from the ADL recently. Yeah, that was wonderful. Good on him. Mm. At first, I wasn't sure if it was even genuine. I thought maybe he had spliced in audio of himself to make it seem like he was arguing with this uh, kvetching yentl, but um, no, apparently it was genuine. Yeah. Um, is it selfish? Or unselfish to have children? Well, I, I would say that's definitely weighted to more towards the selfish aspect of it because it's only ever being done for your own gain. Because, of course, obviously the as yet non-existent person cannot be a a, a, um, a receiver of the gift of life, as is often so. Uh, conceitfully put um, so it's it's never a uh, as, as Benatar described it it's never a net benefit only a net loss because the positive things you may experience in life uh, you wouldn't have been deprived of them if you'd never have existed but the bad things you experience in life you know, that that is very much a, a devaluation from a point of neutrality metaphysically so it is always a, a net loss nothing can really outweigh the tragedy of um, suffering and death well we got the great hell by the dashboard light in the live uh, the live chat and he has a couple of question and a statement mm -hmm. if there's no god why the concern with what is moral Mm. Well, because if we aren't concerned with that, people are going to suffer terribly. I mean, people who already exist. I mean, you said earlier about intermediate. Uh, we, I was talking about intermediate generations. An example of that that I use is that people in the past, um, and medical historians like to downplay just how common an occurrence it was, uh, but people in the past did used to get buried alive, you know, and you have to think, you know, how many people being buried alive is worth the human experiment, you know, uh, and I would say not even one, you know, especially if you think of it as what if I was that one person? Uh, there was a, a book that was written in the early 1970s uh, by a woman named, I think her name was Ursula Gwynn, and that book was called The Ones Who Walk Away from o Omelas. And Omelas is a, a made-up word, but it's um, in, her, in the story that she um, wrote to make this moral point, Omelas is a city, uh, a perfect city where, ev where there is, everything is bountiful and everyone is living in bliss. And the denizens of the city, once they reach a certain age, they learn that the reason that the city is in a constant state of bliss is because there is a child in the center of the city, in the bowels of the city, who is being continuously tortured. And that is the price that has to be paid in order for the city to be heaven on earth. Some people, when they find out this is the case, they choose to leave the city to an, um, an imperfect and difficult life outside of the city because they cannot stand the thought of 
continuing to partake in the the fruits of the the child's suffering you know um is and some some others are perhaps very cold-hearted enough to remain in the city and not allow it to bother them i obviously am one of the people who chose to leave the city uh we got more comments in the chat dashboard is saying uh i think antinatalism is a dangerous mind virus and i i almost mm -hmm. i i think i concur with that and mm -hmm. i think that i don't know um intellectual i think i hate intellectuals in academia more than more than rich people mm -hmm. uh, i want to throw a rock at people uh is not is it not that if you are alive if you're alive should you not fight in this gladiatory you know arena well you can do if, if for no other reason than um, principles and your own personal entertainment but if it um involves risk putting other people at risk people especially people that don't yet exist then i would i would say no i mean the the idea of an as a mind virus of course i understand that's and i anticipate that that's one that people would make um but you know it, it, no, no more so than natalism being a mind virus in its in its own way it is something which is it's very much the default programming so then of course you could say the it's incumbent upon us to make an argument against it rather than for it to defend itself because natalism would be normality then and normality doesn't have to justify itself it's the abnormality in other words us ans who would have to justify ourselves but i think we've done a very good job of doing that We got a whole lot of comments in the chat. I suppose we can just run down the gamut. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't want to. I mean, I got more questions, but God, we're all over the place. Uh, I am only sleeping, says, what does God have to do with morality? Um, and then we've got Dashboard. He's saying, why would I care about being moral if there's no God or afterlife? Why not just be a bad person? Why not just dominate? Uh, um, well, there's a question that has come up before. Um, why be a good person if there's going to be no judgment or reward or punishment for it? I would say that comes down again to empathy and compassion, um, which, you know, stepping back into my old far right shoes, I would say, don't have compassion and empathy for those who are radically different from you, you know, the sort of um, pathological altruism that so many of the liberals suffer for, uh, or at least don't be compassionate to those of other races and such, like at the expense of your own people, definitely. Um, but for, for, for our own people, though, we should have as much compassion as possible. Um, and, you know, remember, of course, that in the generations that have come and gone and the ones that have suffered horrifically, like the Germans in World War II, um, yes, they are dead and gone now, and it was a long time ago, but they were our people too. We could just as easily have been among them. Um... Have you ever been like sick before, Spaz, where you felt like you wanted to die because it was so painful? Yes. I, I have too. I, I've been, you know, I've been around and, you know, there's been times in my life where I was, I got, you know, a stomach, a stomach bug or just something like that really took me out for a couple of days. And I just was like, mm -hmm. get me out of this place. I want to die. I don't want to mm -hmm. be, but I want to mention something. You know, I've gotten older, I've grown, I'm, you know, I'm getting to be middle-aged and I, you know, this whole angle with antinatalism and, and, you know, seeing life as the life cycle as more of a death cycle, but 
I, I said it before. Uh, if you're alive, you're supposed you 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 you're supposed to fight. You're supposed to do something. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I'm trying, I'm going to make an argument. I guess I, as you age, um, does it not maybe dull dull the pain and you know with time? And what I mean by that is, like when I was a kid, I burnt my finger on the stove or with a lighter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now I can burn my finger and it's it's no big deal. Like I'm an older person. Like it doesn't mm -hmm. the pain doesn't doesn't the pain is no effect. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, when I was a kid, like a seven year old, like a burned finger hurt hurt like a hell hurt like hurt like a son of a bitch. But mm -hmm. nowadays, you know, I'm older. So I guess what I'm saying is, is to be kind of the, the pro natalist argument is mm -hmm. that that pain pain dulls with time, mm -hmm. and that you're being mm -hmm. prepared for death, and that you mm -hmm. harden as you age for death. Mm -hmm. Is that a not a fair argument for natalism? Mm -hmm. Well, no. In my case, um, the pain has not dulled. In fact, I would say it's gotten a lot worse. Um, my mother is she's. 62 at the moment um she has suffered with very um severe migraines for nearly 50 years and i've been there for 30 of those years to see how debilitating it is and the, the smallest mercies that it has robbed her of the simplest enjoyments in life that have been ruined for her by this and um, there can be no justification for it and you have to be there and you have to see it anyone who can stand there and look at it and say this is all worth it just so we can you know play video games and have sex and go and conquer out of space the void and i'll tell you that's another big nothing out of space i'd tell that to elon musk um, no, I, I would, I would never even think to try and justify someone suffering like that. Um, have you ever heard of the white man's burden? Yes, I uh, had a falling out with uh, "Do Not Watch" over that subject. Really? Could you tell us mm. about that? Hmm. Well, he oh, was. The and one by the way, real quick, Spaz, shout out to Do Not Watch YouTube channel. Uh, interesting. I, I I don't know. I find his channel a little. It's it's morbid and mm -hmm. a little uh, unsettling. But uh, check out uh, Do Not Watch YouTube channel if you guys haven't heard of it. Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. go ahead, Spaz. He used to be called Anti Natalist Outreach, which I think was a better handle. But uh, oh well, he's gone. I don't know, he sort of marks it, uh, markets his channel in this sort of lemony snicket kind of way now, you know, like, stay away, you know, hoping that will perhaps bring people in. It's, it's strange. But, uh, yeah, falling out we had a couple of weeks ago now. Um, I happen to say, of course, they know about my background, but it's sort of the unwritten law that I don't talk too much about it. And on this occasion... Uh, the NW had the stream open, but he was absent for a while and other people got to talking and they asked me some questions, um, which the answers to which drew upon my past. And I answered them honestly, as I always endeavor to do. Um, and when DNW came back and uh, listened to the stream, that had been going on in his absence. He wasn't very pleased about some of the things I said. Uh, I really don't think I said anything egregious. I said humans are animals and different types of humans evolved in different places under different conditions, different selection pressures, and they therefore have different proclivities. Um, and I said in terms of a functioning civilization, of course, yes, that means that Sub-Saharan Africans are the least suitable for that kind of living. And it's really unfair of us to expect them to perform like we do. It's unrealistic and unfair to expect that. Um, 
Uh, he wasn't very fond of that. I think um, one of them recalled an argument I made before. It w- not my argument, and I didn't actually even say that it was true or not. I simply said it was an argument I heard and that I think could be a good one, or at least very plausible, and that was that um, the historically speaking, it was always remarked that... Um, by the white colonials that the Africans, black Africans, seems to have a lazy streak, sort of chronically. And uh, and I said, one evolutionary explanation for that could be the conservation of energy under the hot African sun, something like that. Um, I didn't say that was true. I said that was one explanation I heard, and it sounds like it could be plausible, if, if you're not a raving liberal, of course. Um, and I think they wanted to poke all these holes in it by saying, oh, but, you know, the Zulu warrior can run 50 miles and fight a battle at the end of it, you know, all those kind of things, you know. I'd say, yeah, well, I'm sure the argument, it, there's more complexity to it than that, than what I recall. I was just making an off-the-cuff remark, you know, as an, an example of something. Um, And they want to interrogate every little aspect of it and try and, back me into a corner over it and I, I told them I've told them before I've said but about these things you can't expect me to know every little detail about it and be able to defend it like an academic on some live stream I say I can tell you where I came across the argument or I can tell you someone who could defend the argument in detail someone like Professor Dutton you know and I say by all means go to him with your questions go to him with your queries you know don't take my word for it don't rely on me to defend all things just because i can't defend something or i don't have the material at hand to do so it doesn't automatically mean that it's racist garbage you know trace these arguments to their source go to the people who make these arguments and you know interrogate them yeah You uh, you have a problem with loyalty to your group? Is that a, an issue for you? I mean, it seems healthy to me. Um, we're not talking about worship. I mean, worship sounds a little demeaning. Uh, you're you're alive. I'm alive, and you should fight to 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 go on. And you know, seeing um, maybe a female of my my counterpart, uh, you know, of my own group, should I not want to? have affection and I mean is that not healthy I mean what what are you talking about no of course it's healthy yes I would encourage that um I mean a lot of people think they think it's strange that I say I adopted AN because I care about our people and I don't want to see them harmed um I would be better if no sentient being had to come to harm, but my background being in the dissident right, obviously I'm gonna I'm gonna think of AN through the lens through an ethno nationalist lens. And rather than conclude that AN is, you know, playing into the hands of what all the lefty elites want, which it, it may be, you know. Uh, I, I I have less of a problem with that because as I say, it's coming from a place of compassion on my part and not wanting our people to be harmed. And I always think, you know, um, it's very clear that the universe um, favours uh, you know, lesser forms of life or, it, you know, it has no regard for us at all, our needs and wants and desires. It doesn't acknowledge or reciprocate us in any way. Um, so therefore, if we were to leave voluntarily um, the stage of history and allow the lesser organisms to be king of the dunghill, um, so be it. Because you know, everything does come to an inevitable end anyway. You know, Spaz, it almost sounds like, I mean, you seem like you're coming from the di- dissident right, you know, the ethnocentric type. It seems, I mean, you almost, it's almost like give up so that take, you take everybody down, 
like whitey give up so everyone else loses as well is that what you're kind of is that what you're mm -hmm. is that your sentiment well you could is think that, is that that whitey already lost whitey's mm -hmm. whitey's been defeated now whitey go extinct so the the mm -hmm. the, the, the colored hordes of the, the of the world can wither <laughs> on the vine is that your angle well i'm not particularly fussed about what happens to them once we're gone i don't imagine it'd be very pleasant. I think they'll perish under the weight of their own incompetence. Um, I don't wish them any particular ill will or, or I'm not out to cause them as much suffering as possible. But uh, obviously, if if they were to perish, it would it'd be nice if it was under more controlled conditions. Um, I mean, I've, I've often said... Um, uh, the only, even then, the best option always would be if none of us had been born in the first place. But um, with all of the people who already exist, the only real solution I can conceive of is this sort of red button scenario where everyone goes to sleep at the same time and doesn't wake up. And when they go to sleep, they have no, they don't know that they won't wake up. So they go to sleep willingly and peacefully. And then they simply don't wake up. Uh, and if that happened to everyone at the same time, that would be a, an ideal solution. But obviously that's not um, feasible. Yeah. Um, I've heard terms like um, humanity, and I just find that a little doesn't sit right with me um that we're all in it together mm -hmm. and like human beings mm -hmm. are collectively responsible for what's happened in the world i, I don't know that mm -hmm. like certain groups have a, had an effect mm -hmm. on the world more than others uh, am i wrong yeah no, i'm simply using it as a as a, a word because you know i'm a product of the 21st century and it's going to be in my lexicon to refer to all humans as a collective but of course you know you you can make the argument that humanity as a concept is a christian concept an egalitarian concept um you can make that argument i know caesar taught would make that argument but um the, and you know in his view humanity only extends as far as our race and our folk you know yeah, it's almost like we're going to, like the certain groups from, hum, quote, humanity are the are the problem, not, uh, how do I say it? Like people say there's too many people. You've probably said it. There's what, eight, seven, eight, six billion people in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't say there's too many people. I say there's too many of the wrong people. Uh, what do you think about that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you can you can definitely make that argument, and it's it's always going to be the case. It always has been the case because there is a scientific formula. I can't remember what it's called right now, but it's something to the effect of ninety percent of everything is crap, something like that. You know, which I think is something which you don't need to devise any tests. Well, to that's almost kind of evident with with the yeah. dating, web, dating websites. Mm -hmm. Or professional sports um you it's know. true of, it's true of absolutely anything i mean someone who was you know who, who worked in a mine could tell you that you know that most of the stuff they dig up is crap you know they're looking for that small sliver of gold you know needle in a haystack kind of thing um some people think that it, it's an intrinsic property of valuable things that they are rare um other people would say that you know diamond is still just as beautiful even if there are millions and millions of them um is it not maybe bad stewards um people who are organizing society um and um, i I'm, I'm gonna maybe speak a little how do i say this i don't want to sound crazy um we got maybe people at the organizing society, people at the top ensnaring the white race. And because of this ensnarement, 
um, used as a force to destroy the white race. How do I say this? God, um, well, if it wasn't for Whitey's mental illness or enslavement, there wouldn't be 8 billion people on the planet. And that um, mm -hmm. without white people, the non-whites wouldn't be so prevalent. Does that make sense? Am I sounding way weird or nuts? Well, I think more accurately, it would, it would be more accurate to say they wouldn't be so prevalent if it weren't for Christian missionaries, uh, the, their, their, their impulse they had. Because, um, you know, I mean, throughout the history of colonialism, there was this sort of um, um, dual narrative at work. You had the old residual paganistic spirit of the white man wanting to conquer the world, and then mixed in with that, you had the uh, Christian conviction to save all souls. I mean, you so, could almost blame liberalism for 8 billion people being in the world, having Whitey being so compassionate and caring and wanting to feed mm. quote, the birds, um, giving fine, uh, foreign aid, um, su supplying the, the meek with, with um, mm -hmm. things they yeah. wouldn't get otherwise. Yeah. Well, this is the tragedy of, um, not necessarily, but it's what can happen. Um, and they warned about it in Victorian times. I mean, um, for a very blunt example, you have someone like the character of Ebenezer Scrooge saying, you know, if the poor are to be poor and are to die destitute, then let them do so and decrease the surplus population. Now, morally, whether it's Christian or not to think so, that seems repugnant to say that, especially about our own people, you know. Um, the poor, poverty-stricken whites. Um, but I, you have to be brutally honest and say, technically it is true that uh, the the more you seem to try and help, um, there's, there's, there's a deficit in some other area. I mean, um, it's, it's a bit, I think of it a bit like the, you know, they say that energy can't be destroyed, only transferred. And they say something like that in physics. I think it's the same thing with trying to help the poor and unfortunate. The more you try to help them, um, the more they will then proliferate. And if their problems are genetic, then those genes will proliferate, you know, um, irrespective of improvements in the social environment. Um, so in trying to help, you are then that's the problem. So it, it, it's like a it's like a trolley dilemma, you know, where you think, do we help them? You know, we're helping those immediately before us, and then, but then also in a way, extending the problem because then they'll create more of themselves. Or do we callously ignore them and leave them to their fate, and then they disappear? You know, but then of course they suffer horribly. Um. A lot of the times I can only present these problems. I can't offer a direct solution to them. I mean, I've often said that I don't think there really is a solution to a lot of these human problems. I think they are endemic to the human condition itself. As long as humans exist, these problems will exist. The only way to really solve them is to obliterate them at the source um pvl uh i'm sorry but that's just wrong i mean yeah i i mean you're right about the whole illiberal but this you know they're being such a if it wasn't for whitey and this or you know the west you know with you know this this these trade agreements i mean th without whitey china would be not where it's it is today frankly Hmm. Well, I think it's remarkable that the Chinese or just East Asians in general have suffered all these apparently very large genocides over the 20th century and yet it doesn't seem to have made a dent. They are still yeah, sort of yeah, that's, that is interesting. incredibly populous. Um, I know that sounds quite, quite flippant, but just in terms of pure statistics, I mean... Uh, it doesn't seem to have altered the demographic trajectory. 
Um, and of course, so you have not only the genocides in Asia, but the the one child policies and the killing of the baby girls, uh, all of that. Even then, they are still over. There's still over a billion of them. Yeah, it is frightening. I mean, I've seen the way that some of them live in, you know, these so-called shoebox apartments that they live in, where there's barely room to move. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe it's just me having a low threshold for suffering, but I'd rather die than live like that. Yeah, but they're kind of like an ant people. And mm. they have interest, well, uh, group yeah. interest, uh, yeah. maybe more ties to the collective group yeah. than maybe the, the diaspora whites, the, the, the white yeah. race being sort yeah. of all over the world. And they're more of a more, um, I don't know, connected and in, in yeah. more of a togetherness um, aspect. Well, well, the East Asians, to Europeans anyway, have always seemed somewhat in insect like, you know, hive like. Uh, not just in the sense that there's very little um, phenotypic variation among the Asians, but also in the sense that they seem to think in unison. They're a much more regimented society, and that's been compounded under communism. Um, I think it's intimidating to um, whites, not just because we are a very physically diverse people, but because it is an affront to the sort of what Kevin McDonald called the in individualism and the Western liberal tradition, you know, which, well, I say tradition, I think the argument is that it began with the French Revolution. The sort of um, hyper individualism. So. I've heard you say, Spaz, I've heard you say that no one's happy with their life and that they're always trying to get more and to, to progress and to have, evolve and to get and to uh, ob 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 obtain popularity or status or knowledge or wealth or or uh, um, uh, obtain, um, uh, acquire. And mm -hmm. I think that that's normal and that mm -hmm. things are never complete. And that that's that's my case. That's my argument for that journey is actually greater than destination and that intellectuals and academic types and, and autistic people are just wrong. Um, it doesn't matter that the whole world's going to end in 20 years or a thousand years or a million years. The journey is actually more important than the destination. And, and what do you what do you say to that? I say again, they're forgetting about the people for whom the journey is absolutely horrific. They're ignoring them and they're, they're legitimizing their sacrifice, really. And it's not a sacrifice for those of us who suffer. We, life we don't make life sucks. Life sucks. And it's yeah. hard and it's tough, uh, Spaz. But life, mm -hmm. you know what life is? Life's making a leap. Life mm -hmm. is getting away. Um, um, escaping um, to fight another day or obtaining dominance or, or power. That's mm -hmm. what life is. Uh, so isn't, isn't the journey more kind of greater in the grand scheme mm -hmm. of things more important? But, the journey is more important than the destination. Am I not, am I wrong? I think so. Yeah. Because um, not only is the journey often horrific, for a lot of people, um, fact that the destination is complete and utter oblivion that does nullify what has come before i mean you know i often think of it as if if a is the point at which you start and then you you spend your whole life traveling to to b that is that's like is. making the assumption that there's a b like let's say there's no b it's just a and then it's infinity a to infinity mm -hmm. what do you say to that I'd say I don't understand the question. It doesn't make sense. Well, there is no actual destination. It's forever evolving. It's a continuous flow. It, there's no, there's no stopping or no, no, um, no place to go. It's, it's infinite. Mm -hmm. Well, that in itself is horrifying.
Um, I think so. Well, I want to. I well, we got somebody in the chat who says, um, "I'm I'm only sleeping." Says Loop. Um, how do I? Where do I put this? Uh, how do I put this? Uh, yeah, I mean that kind of that kind of uh, maybe adds to it. Uh, where it, it there is no there is no place to end up, but. I don't know where I'm going with that. <laughs> Do you have anything to say to that? Wasn't articulated. Yeah. I mean, yeah right. So I was, all right. So, do you think that um, a tiger, a baby cub, uh, um, a baby, a baby bear, bear cub, or or um, any sort of predator in the in nature? You know the 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 the, the offspring, um, whether it's a baby cub or um, a baby tiger, are they innocent? In and of themselves, yeah, they don't choose to be a predator. They can't help the way they're programmed, and obviously, it's a necessity for them to eat meat, as it is for us as well. Although, not. Quite to the same extent because we aren't exclusively carnivores or herbivores we are naturally omnivorous but predators they have to eat meat or else they'll starve to death you know if you come across a lion that won't um kill a gazelle because of some uh, humanistic uh, idea of compassion well that would be extraordinary in itself and a lion is going to end up dying um but he would be dying for his principles, I suppose. Um, well, I just, I don't know. We attach innocence too frivolously, I believe. I mean, just because mm -hmm. you see like a baby Negro or a baby, baby Jew uh, <laughs> is not maybe like you said it. I think you said it. I mean, life is zero sum um, mm -hmm. with one, uh, one race diametrically opposed to another. Mm -hmm. uh, to see a, any any infant child as innocent, I don't believe that's accurate. Am I am I wrong, Spaz? Mm -hmm. Well, um, propositionally, um, all of the um, what we call potential persons um, they are all e they are all equal in the sense that they're all innocent. They've obviously they don't exist, so they've they've done nothing to to prove themselves worthy of any kind of condemnation and we have we have to by default think of the unborn but as that's all like born. negating the fact that every creature has a duty um a, i would say a responsibility to like every creature has an interest um to do what is best for them mm -hmm. um you know this idea that we're gonna train it out of them who, what are you talking about like a lion's mm -hmm. gonna do what a lion's gonna do um, yeah. A black person is going to do what a black person is going to do. Mm -hmm. A white person, well, maybe not because white people are mentally ill and insane, but <laughs> white people are going to do what white people are going to do. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Like, what are you going to what? So it's an infant being and you're going to what? Put put ideas in that that being's head. Uh, should he should these different people, different creatures, different forms of life? Or is it not that they have a duty to do what they're supposed to do? Do you believe that? That we're supposed... You're on this earth. You're, you're supposed to do something, right? Um, I don't see that, that follows. I mean, it's this idea of a... I mean, I, I'm not a moral nihilist, but I think definitely an existential nihilist. I don't see any overarching reason for any of us being here I mean this this sigues into my arguments about the inexistence of God that's another video I did um, not as long as the one you watched um, on Danny Shine's channel um, I spoke a bit about that as well that, that one, I think, is about half the length of the video you watched. Yeah, I don't know, man. I just think that 
you have a purpose or um, a duty to 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 do what you're supposed to do and i don't think that and i'm not i'm not like limiting that to any specific form of life i think all forms of life are working should work towards the benefit mm -hmm. of that gen genet uh you know genetics or what uh, uh mm -hmm. you know a life form mm -hmm. you know there's a do you do you know the channel in mendham no I'll put it in the private chat i'll check it out mm. well he's um he's an antinatalist who um although i think he has flirted with some sort of dissident ideas um and i definitely wouldn't categorize him as a liberal progressive woke type definitely not he um one of his videos uh, is called, uh, uh, I can't remember the specific title of it, but I know it, it has the word Ethelism in the title. Um, and that's a very good video for describing life, what it is, stripped of any romanticism, just looking at it as these molecules that seek to replicate for the sake of replicating for no no purpose they it's just what they do you know and he puts it in such stark bleak terms you know it is a, a punch to the gut it is very hard to stomach um for, for a lot of people i mean i i accepted it without much protest uh, but other people out there, I can see it sending them into some kind of depression. You know, it's about a five minute video. And yes, it has footage of animals being ripped to pieces and such like uh, with his voiceover uh, talking about how um, he describes the you know life on Earth, the game of life, the struggle of life as being the uh, biggest bar of fools gold on Earth. The sort of carrot on a stick that keeps the intergenerational treadmill going. Well, I'm sure you've heard some of this before, but people in the chat are saying some things. Uh, the purpose of life is survival and reproduction. Mm -hmm. um, you got you got to consider. Um, these are different people. Um, Mick Mars is saying mm -hmm. you have to consider the idea that when you die, you might cease to exist completely. Might as well stay alive and watch the show. And I, 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 real quick, real quick, Spaz, I second Mick Mars. Um, I'm here. Mm -hmm. I'm alive. I want to mm -hmm. see the insanity play out. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't. I don't want to die. Uh, do you have anything to say to these these uh, comments? Well, yeah, that doesn't have anything to do with the antinatalist principle, does it? I mean, yes, stay alive and do whatever, as long as it's not procreating. I mean, yeah, you can, you can watch the shit show without procreating you know i've not sought to rob anyone of that in fact i haven't even sought to rob people of the ability to reproduce i simply try and present these arguments to them because my ultimate goal is only that they are informed to the best of my ability so that they they can't then procreate and have it go horribly wrong and say they weren't warned you know Benatar has, with his books, um, given the most comprehensive um, and, you know, kindly worded warning that anyone could produce. Um, and he fully expects that it will mostly fall on deaf ears. Um so it makes you wonder what then his motivation has been for writing this stuff if he knows most people is going to, going to ignore it. And I've listened to a number of interviews with him. I've spoken to him very briefly by email a number of years ago. Um, so these he, ideas that you adhere to, um, AN, antinatalism, much of these ideas, um, they stem from... A Jewish intellectual is that fair? Is is so mm -hmm. you, these ideas that you you subscribe to mm -hmm. come from a Jewish individual, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
The thing is, though, the... do you not see the argument from the dissident right that maybe maybe that's what maybe that's um what, of course I what can. well that that Jew that's a that's a self interest for Jews to have people mm -hmm. like yourself adhere to these ideas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it's not that he's um, trying to sell it to white people. He doesn't actually mention race at all. The goyim, the the masses, the non Jews. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he is uh, not had any children himself. And he he says that it is uh, something which goes, you know, obviously it's something that goes beyond ethnicity and culture and all those kinds of kinds of things. Um, uh, you know, Nick Mars, I, yeah, Sam Harris, I believe, is a liberal Jew. Um, what's Benatar? Mm -hmm. Is that his name? David Benatar. Yeah. Benatar, he's a Jew. These are all like intellectual mm -hmm. Jews that have convinced Spaz of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, anti-natalism. Well, I, I wouldn't say Sam Harris, but this philosopher, mm. this academic. Uh, of, of all the of all the people that Benatar has sat down and had oh, a And by the way, real quick, fuck Sam Harris. Fuck that guy. I'd like to throw a rock at his face if I could, if it was legal. Well, he does bring a tepid liberal perspective to many issues, as I've said. But I am glad that he wrote that book, The Moral Landscape. Um, I think that was much needed. Um um, what for whatever faults it may have, I think it is the sort of indictment we need against all this postmodern um, relativism. I'm only sleeping. That's a fair statement. Um, Spaz, I, I, I mean, maybe this Jew's a, a trickster. How do you know he yeah. doesn't have kids? He could just be saying mm -hmm. that. I don't know. I don't think he's been on mm -hmm. video. Uh, you haven't seen his children. No. He could have no. children. Is that not a he, fair statement? He, he uh, guards his private life and he. Uh, won't appear on camera. I believe that's because he's concerned about threats that have been made against his life. Because, of course, he is advocating what is uh, probably one of, if not the most, incendiary um, views imaginable. Um, although uh, that's the way a lot of people see it. I certainly don't see it as anywhere near as incendiary as people who argue for you know, the normalization of pedophilia or bestiality or whatever um but yeah uh, for a lot of people they they see him in a similar light and they're they're very intimidated by him i mean there was a um a philosopher in finland called sami pilstrom who he did not bother to actually um engage in any of benetite's arguments he simply said that this man is so dangerous to the continuation of civilization, which of course he took as a given and something good and noble, um, that we should deplatform him and ignore him and not not treat his ideas with any legitimacy whatsoever. Now, to me, that sounded exactly the same as all of the woke liberals who refused to talk about race and sex differences, and all of the Jews who refused to talk about, you know. Um, Jewish radicalism and the history of subversion and such like, and conflict with Gentiles uh, coming from their behavior. It, it, it smacks of that to me. It sounds exactly the same thing. They're trying to deplatform him and ignore him and deprive him of oxygen because they're terrified of what he's saying. And the fact, of course, that he's Jewish is I'm not blind to that. I know the, the history of. Jewish radicalism and intellectuals and such like. I'm very well aware of that. But all of Benatar's arguments stand very well, logically, on their own, irrespective of who he is. Whereas, say, someone like Franz Boas from the early 20th century, the arguments he made in favour of you know, race as a social construct and all that, not only were they coming from a very subversive character, a sort of Marxist Jew, but they were in and of themselves ridiculous statements you know the race is a socio-optical illusion and everything's environment all this kind of nonsense they are self-evidently absurd and that has been proven over the course of the last century um whereas benatar's arguments though are uh, they're perfectly uh, congruent i mean they're um what's the word internally consistent um and they will they will uh, resonate with you if you are a compassionate person, you know, either for your own people or 
just all sentient life in general. So the fact that uh, Benatar is, is Jewish doesn't really come into it. And of course, I know a lot of people from the dissident right would view me as being very naive, and they might say that I've been um, hoodwinked by all sorts of um, Jewish abstraction. They might say all that sort of thing. Of course, I'm perfectly aware of all that. Um, but I have analysed these arguments very intimately. And, you know, especially when viewing them through the lens of my own suffering in life and the suffering of my mother. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I have to concede that, that he has been honest. Ah, uh, yeah, in your view. Hmm. Oh, well, that's a bit relative. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't uh, adopt the uh, tactic of the enemy. Uh, <laughs> uh, you're an anti-natalist. Um, would you prefer uh, whites disappear or whites maybe dominant and mm. maybe maybe um, head of head of ship, head of uh, mm. uh, you know. Uh, uh, white man's burden. Um, mm -hmm. Would you prefer whites disappear or maybe whites dominating the world? Um, well, I would say um, as an anti-natalist, I would rather all of humanity went ex uh, extinct. But I think if if people if civilization is going to continue if human beings are going to continue to exist and all the evidence suggests that they will because they it's about reproduction is all about ego uh, in the case of us uh, racialized ego uh, i would say if they are going to reproduce then obviously it would be better to have the most competent and talented people at the helm and those do happen to be people of European descent. Um, I've heard, uh, I've, I've seen like people wear t-shirts and, and bumper stickers where it says life is good. Um, does the burden of proof lie on the, the those type of folks? Mm. Um, the, the life is good, folks. The people that say life is good isn't that their their burden of proof to, mm. to explain? Well, for every one person whose life is good by their own evaluation, um, there are probably ten or more people for whom life is excruciating. And even if it were the reverse, and it was the case that for every ten people who are blissful. Um, and only one person was living an excruciating life. Again, for me, that's too many. Because, of course, I am, I see myself in that one person, you know, in the child of MLS. Go back to the analogy from the book. Um, all of us who suffer terribly, uh, we are all the sacrificial lamb, so to speak. Yeah, I mean... Sort of, I, I, could, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts about reincarnation? And maybe um, mm. just, I'm just curious, maybe you want to just tell me what you think uh, briefly about reincarnation instead of, mm -hmm. um, we're not, you know, these different religious zealots and, you know, different um, religious groups, you know, people have their kind of line of thinking. What do you think about reincarnation? Well, um, it's probably, well, it's a less anthropocentric concept than the Abrahamic religions, but it still does have some anthropocentrism to it. I mean, if you are constantly being reborn as a new entity, um, the question then, of course, arises, who are you really? You don't have a consistent identity. You don't, you know, it's forever subject to change. You are sort of a, um, a shapeshifter in a way. And then some people might say, well, the, um, 
the 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 organism you're born as, the form you take, isn't important. What matters is you have the same soul. I say, well, if the soul is all that matters, then why do we have mortal bodies? It's ridiculous. I mean, the mortal body, where we are subjected to all kinds of degradation and humiliation and indignity, it is all completely pointless. There's no justification for it whatsoever. An, an immortal soul has no need for this flesh prison. It's a downgrade. It is a, you know, degrading the state of affairs. I think the, probably the, the, the worst argument... Uh, I well, I want to sort of add to that. Um, you say it downgrades. I think that I could say the same for a lot of AN people. Um, the burden of proof kind of lies on AN when it comes to the idea that we live in some magnificent galaxy. I'm not so sure we do. Uh, we've been lied to about everything. I see it more as a, a complex Truman show than a, being a speck of something with, um, in, a, in wild infinity cosmo bullshit. Um, mm -hmm. If you're alive and your group, your tribe, your species, whether you're an African man or a lion or a tiger or, or a fish that Maybe the world does revolve, revolve a lot, uh, around them because it's their interest. They're like, you're overthinking it. You need to go and live your life. Um, this idea that we're just some speck in the universe and that, you know, we, I, I just, I maybe just discount that, I think, Spaz. And if you want to maybe uh, just, you know, bounce back at me with what I just said, uh, what, mm. I, what I just said. Mm. Well, we autistic people, um, we always want to discover what the truth is, even if that truth might be very unpleasant and and shatter our illusions. I'm not entirely sure why we have this, what some people have described as a remarkable dedication to honesty and truth-seeking, but it's the way we are. Um, and some people would say... I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm real quick, Spaz. I'm just thinking that perspective kind of matters and that we're not all in this together and that everyone's fighting right and and mm -hmm. in this gladiatory arena well mm -hmm. from the perspective of one being to another their self-importance i think is maybe legitimate mm. yeah yeah um what is the point you're making that your abstract truth is sort of bullshit and that I'm alive and my life matters and my group matters and my, my interests matter and that I'm more important in my own eyes than mm -hmm. some intellectual trying to tell me that I'm some speck of dust. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, you know, it's trouble with, I mean, in more recent years, more and more of the, truths that people have accepted axiomatically have been falling apart and it can of course lead to thinking uh, to um, casting a conspiratorial eye on everything uh, for instance my own mother uh, sometimes that's the last thing I would expect her to say but in, in the last few years uh, she's come to me saying things like you know how do we know dinosaurs were real or how do we know the Earth is is uh, six billion years old or whatever? How, I, I don't how... think you don't. I don't think anybody knows that. I, I, I don't. Mm -hmm. I, this idea that these are like truth. I, I'm not so sure. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, the idea that uh, I, I mean, I, people making these these grandiose statements about the history of the world. I mean, I don't have to. I don't have reason to believe it as much as I've been lied to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I always think, for me, the the way I determine what's true in the absence of evidence um, is obviously always use reason first, I think, which is natural for us because we are thinking beings. We think before we do anything else. Um, the I, w I would say... Um, The answer to a question 
the most most likely what I think gives something truth candidacy is how awful it is. The more awful an explanation is, the more likely it is to be true. And on that basis, I think you are left with really two options. And that is either um, we live in this barren universe that was not created for any purpose and our existence is uh, entirely happenstance and that's why nothing seems to work or we were created by some malevolent deity uh, for his own personal amusement perhaps I mean some people have made the argument that perhaps an all-powerful omnipotent god existing alone it would be drive him mad you know so he had to create us to share in his misery <laughs> oh man um i think those are the only two explanations that are tenable i want to make a statement about maybe why antinatalism sounds a little right to me mm -hmm. um parents and family members um maybe not willing to help um spoiled kids um that have everything being cruel to their parents um mm -hmm. being very um unsettling to their parents and 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 mean um uh, um being pushed out by by boomers and different organizations you know i i was in a golf group and i got i got pigeonholed as a as a homophobe and kicked out mm -hmm. so if my own mm -hmm. group people of my community have discarded me why mm -hmm. should i not be antinatalist i i guess that's maybe an art to me i i'm i'm seeing there's some stuff within antinatalism that it, it's not totally illogical but i think that maybe it's a little overthinking it and maybe mm -hmm. so i'm 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 kind of a, i'm halfway agreeing I, i'm i'm seeing some arguments in, in life you know, when I see a dead bird outside a, at a, a, you know, outside a restaurant suffering and about to, or not a dead, a, a suffering animal, um, having, you know, having different people of my own group reject, uh, I don't know, maybe that's part of it. Like white people are such a mess. Um, mm -hmm. White people aren't a part of anything. They have no country. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're a stateless people. And they're getting maybe wrapped, maybe people like yourself are getting wrapped up into these kind of abstract um, suicidal ideas um, as mm -hmm. part of part of antinatalism's ability to be a, a to even a, um, to even be a talking point in society mm -hmm. where we're because Whitey's on an island, Whitey's on on his own. And that's why maybe Whitey's got these kind of well, maybe Jews are pushing this shit, too, or whatever, but. I, I, I think that maybe that has something to do with it, that Whitey's been so um, demoralized that that they adhere to some of these ideas. Uh, is that maybe mm -hmm. fair? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, you could say that, but um, I, th I think reality is demoralizing. I really don't see that... Um, the enemy, whoever you might want to say it is, has had to work very hard to um, make us depressed. I think all you have to do is shine a spotlight on reality and bring it to everyone's attention for long enough. Um, a lot of people have these inbuilt coping mechanisms, which Benatar has described in detail. Um, but I think there are some of us who don't have them or have found a way to disable them and we look at life illuminated in all of its horrors and we are aghast and I think as well um, the idea of humanity's extinction is problematic for people because it is pretty much saying we are defeated there's nothing we can do and that is such a soul killing ego rape for them you know um 
and and obviously the the um the reward if you could call it that for human extinction that is no more human suffering because it's an intangible thing that they won't personally get to partake in but they'll struggle to see it as such but you have to remember of course that um human extinction is an inevitability um i uh has this been a a big big moment for you this week uh spaz just having this chat with me on the internet is it a highlight of your week I think so. So it's more exciting than anything else I've done. And my mother thinks it's therapeutic for me to talk to other people, even if the subject matter might be a bit morbid, because, um, well, not only am I spreading awareness of these important issues, it's simply good for me to have some kind of human contact, even if it is just through speaking, because I am very cut off and alone is that maybe an argument for why you think this way i i, I really do think spaz like mm -hmm. you have some things that you can contribute to the world uh so you could do some you know big important things and you know yeah you're you're sort of hindered and maybe um handicapped slightly but there's still things that you could do and if you were doing those things maybe you wouldn't think this way is that a fair statement mm-hmm Hmm. Although the the truth of I'll give you an example. Uh, maybe you should. I heard your, you know, uh, essay. You, you you read your essay on the air. Um, you're a good reader. Uh, I, you should you should read more uh, dr books on a live stream and hmm. that, that would I mean you would develop a following. Um, hmm. you know you'd put out information. You'd have more hmm. of a purpose, uh, something to uh, hmm. a task at hand, something hmm. you need to do and. I think you're a great reader. Uh, listening to you read is very pleasant. So I think you should maybe focus on some of the skills that you do have. Mm. Well, I'd have to disagree. I, I really dislike the sound of my voice when I hear it played back because it sounds so different to what I hear. What I hear in my when I speak is a voice which is quite soft and um, passive. Well, maybe but some when, of people like that. It's a nice bedtime but when, story. You but, be when I, but when I hear it played back on the uh, recording, I, I always think it sounds incredibly autistic and stilted and monotone, very little inflection. That can be because I'm trying to say the words as clearly as possible without any accent um, and at a slower pace so people can understand what I'm saying. Um, it was in contrast to, say, someone like Professor Dutton, who sort of speaks a mile a minute. Yeah. Um, oh, briefly, why don't you tell us what you think of Dutton briefly, uh, quickly? Mm -hmm. I, I think yeah. he's kind of a I, I can't yeah. I mean, I'm subscribed to his channel, but fuck, I can't I can't do it. Dutton fucking annoys the fuck out of me. But go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, he is. um I don't know if he is autistic or not, but he, some, in some respects, he seems more autistic than I am. Um, very fast speaker. Uh, I often listen to his videos at uh, time two speed, uh, just to save time. Uh, I can pick up, can, I can still understand what he's saying, uh, funnily enough. Um, uh, I do that with a lot of videos, actually. I put them on increased speed. Um, because of course these days we all have the attention span of a gnat We're trying to fit in so much, aren't we? Um, I definitely have to put it on uh, increased speed if I listen to myself talk because it's just so slow and plodding, you know. I think, um, I'm listening to my own voice. Well, I'm telling soon. you, I'm telling you, Spaticus, I think you should do more reading. I think people do enjoy hearing you speak. And and I think you'd be good at uh, doing audiobooks. I think that would be in your wheelhouse. And maybe you should maybe 
think about taking that up. Because, mm. mm. you know, people mm. need to hear these wise words from maybe books like Schopenhauer and Nietzsche or, or whoever. Mm. Um, and that maybe mm. that's maybe maybe that's something that you uh, maybe that should be one of your hobbies. Yeah. Um, well, as I did say last time, I, I, I don't tend to read many books from front to back. Um, certainly, I don't yeah, read any. You don't have to do a whole book on it. You just do one chapter at a time or what? You know what I mean? It's it's baby steps. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Um, I have an awful lot of books on my bookshelf. Um, I tend to just look at the chapters and pick out the ones which I think would be most relevant to what I want to know rather than uh, read them chronologically in their entirety. Uh, that's what I did with McDonald's book. Um, well, just one of his books, actually, because he wrote three. I only read parts of the last one. Um, and, and some people, they can get confused and they think, well, how do you know um, all of this stuff so coherently if you're only taking little bits and pieces, you know? And I say, well, my mind tends to sort of fill in the blanks sometimes. I uh, infer uh, what I don't know. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's, some people think it's a remarkable ability. I mean, I, uh, I got into trouble with the police a few years ago because I, in my naivete, I reached out to a young lady uh, who was like one of these Instagram models, you know, very, very beautiful young lady, one of the prettiest I've ever seen, uh, had all the advantages you could imagine, and but she started getting these tattoos, and uh, I, I, I've, I'd seen this sort of thing happen with my my cousin, who isn't anywhere nearly as attractive as this young girl, and it ends horribly. So I um, wrote her a very heartfelt email trying to persuade her to stop this behavior. Um, and uh, she actually went to the police and uh, she thought perhaps I was some kind of stalker or something because I, I had inferred certain intimate details about her life. And she said, how could anyone possibly know these things unless they were a stalker or something? And I said, well, for me, it was not, I mean, I had to explain to the police. I said, I'm autistic. And it didn't seem like much of a leap in logic to make the deductions that I was making. I mean, I, she had um, suffered some kind of weight loss after she had contracted sepsis. And um, her quite considerably large natural bust had gone down a few sizes. And I inferred in my email to her that this had been contracted through the needle of a tattoo artist. Now, she never confirmed whether I'd got this right or not, but she was quite upset. And I think, therefore, I well, was probably the truth, correct. Uh, the truth makes people a little angry. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, mean, I, I said... I, I... I, I agree with you, Spaz, in the AN community when they when I hear like like tropes or whatever, like life is good, like mm -hmm. like prove it. Like fuck you, dude. Mm -hmm. Like I don't like being lied to. Don't tell me life is good just just without any mm -hmm. I don't know, these these sort of random uh, you know statements that I've seen or or quotes about how great life is and mm -hmm. you know, life's not fair. So, you know, mm -hmm. sort of um rubbing rubbing people's nose in it kind of maybe hurts my feelings a little or i don't know like bothers mm. me well you know it, it um the, the the whole um episode with that young young lady is is actually i mean it was a turning point for me because i uh, for the longest time i just couldn't understand it i thought here is someone who has got every advantage that i don't have or they have all these advantages which i have lost with age because um, not to brag, I used to be a very attractive child. Uh, some people thought I could be like a catalog model or something like that. Um, uh, but unfortunately, my looks 
did not survive puberty. I don't know. I, I when I hear that spaz, I I hear um almost an argument to like uh, an argument in the support of like an incel community. Life is never mm. life changes. Things change. Mm -hmm. um, the cool kid when he's eighteen gets the prom girl. Might be a fucking ugly fat kid by the age thirty. Like you kind of everyone has mm -hmm. a different life arc, and I think that. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe you're, it's, it's unfortunate for you because your best years are behind you. But mm -hmm. I, I'm not trying to, pick, you know, pick on you. I'm saying that everybody's life's different, and maybe you were that good looking as a baby, and you could have monetized that in some way in a different life. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is, is that to the incels out there, yeah, you know, well, I just, I, to, to anyone out there, I would just say like, don't give up on life. Like you're, you're already here. Mm -hmm. You're like you're already here, so things. Well, you know, it, it's things, it's things um, change. Things fucking change. Yeah, I mean, I I I think I was sort of lulled into a false sense of security, and you know, I'd uh, I'd won a few heats, but I fell in the final. You know, um, it, and that's as I say again, um, the end game is what is the arbiter of of something's value you know how it ends up in the end um oh uh, yeah uh, gain um loss is different for everyone um you may mm -hmm. gain later you may gain earlier um you may lose uh later i i, I things are constantly moving and mm -hmm. i just I, I think it that you know that maybe my father's not totally wrong that you know change mm -hmm. change is good <laughs> Well, you know, we we autistic people hate change um, because we, well, we've had enough experience with it. Uh, we I've always hated it um, because obviously there's no consent or consultation there. It just happens, and you just have to, you know, roll with the punches. And and some people are adept at doing that, but they aren't the focus of the moral argument I'm making. The moral argument I'm making is that the sole focus should be the the people who come off the absolute worst. I mean, I did tell you, um, to finish what I was saying about that model, though, um, yeah, the, for me that illustrated that someone can have it all and then deliberately, you know, uh, screw themselves out of it. You know, um, I mean, that young girl now, she's nearly 30. and um, she, lost, well, um, she lost her looks. She well, well, I mean, she maybe still she didn't know what she had, and then other people they they maybe they obtain. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she she definitely knew what she had. I mean, but uh, she was like a competition winner and such. Like, could have easily won Miss Multiverse. But I tell you, um, I think in her case, it was that she started hanging out with the wrong crowd. She started hanging out with girls who were well, obviously less attractive than her. Girls who had tattoos and such like. And for whatever bizarre reason, uh, rather than be her own guiding light, she wanted to fit in with these peers of hers. And, of course, as we know, women um, evolutionarily, I think Dutton could make the argument much better than I can, but they seem to have a much greater desire to, uh, desire to conform and follow trends. Uh, there's sort of a... Uh, and that comes down to the whole what Dutton calls, I think, security and harm avoidance or something like that, you know, yeah, which yeah. is weird, which is weird because you would think, well, we anti-natalists obviously are very focused on harm avoidance. Arguably more so than any other demographic. Yeah, maybe. Mm. I mean... Is it not maybe harmful to push ideas that life isn't as good as it, they think it is? Maybe that's harmful. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I mean, it obviously can be beneficial. You're going to rain on everybody's parade. Maybe you're, maybe you're kind of, mm -hmm. maybe you are harmful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I say that um, if you're going to indict us and Benatar on those grounds, then, you know, you, you should also indict all the nature doc documentaries <coughs> that show all the animals getting ripped apart because, you know, they're highlighting reality 
just as we are, you know, but because the subject matter is animals and rather than humans, um, people don't get quite as upset over it. It's weird, though, because some people get more upset. Some people are a lot more troubled by animal suffering than they are by human suffering. I think uh, the Fuhrer himself would be an example of that. Um, are you familiar with Mr. Bean? He, the actor, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, Casual Bachelor posted an image. Um, you're a man, right? Spaz? Well, ob obviously. <laughs> um, do you not want to win? Uh, I don't see that there's anything to be won. Well, Mr. Bean, and I'm talking, a casual bachelor posted something, and it was a quote from Mr. Bean, mm -hmm. uh, a fellow brother of yours, you know, living in the UK. <laughs> oh, well, maybe mm -hmm. not brother, but, uh, you know, national origin. Mm -hmm. You're a UK guy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He said, uh, you can't defeat a man who doesn't care about pain, failure, rejection, loss, disrespect and heartbreak he is here to win um mm -hmm. maybe, maybe you're not a man spaz and i'm not trying to be disrespectful but mm -hmm. maybe you're not a real man a quote real man is that mm -hmm. are you low mm -hmm. people maybe want to criticize you say you're low t you're mm -hmm. weak. Yeah. like man yeah. up man up buddy boyo what do you say yeah. what do you say to that i'm very aware of that it's the um I wonder if they would say the same thing to all those millions of Germans that were killed most brutally. Would they dismiss them in as cavalier a fashion? Uh, I don't know. Maybe that's fair to say. Uh, maybe you're deflecting a little. Uh... I mean, Benatar says, one, one, of the, one of the quotes he says, which I really like, was he said that um, the, the uh, injunction to man up and you know uh, embrace the struggle and all this sort of nietzsche and crap um as, as i say i think the only good thing nietzsche did was when he spoke about christianity other than that i'm not really interested but uh yeah this this whole this attitude this he calls it a macho attitude but then he also says obviously men don't have a monopoly on it it's if, in, fact, in fact a lot of the time it's women that say things like man up as i'm sure you well know uh, it's one of their shaming tactics, but um, the whole white feather routine. But the, the um, yeah, the, this whole man up idea, it is a, uh, I have to remember now what he described it as. He said it is a an inappropriate indifference to the severity of suffering, which I think describes it very simply and very perfectly as what it is, you know. Um. Yes, there may be some people who seem to thrive on adversity and struggle and all the rest of it, uh, but they are not the focus. They are not the moral, the the, the moral focus. You know, um, I think I heard you uh, talk about obsession with truth, and that that's mm -hmm. that's for. Mm -hmm. It's a very. It's a very. It's a very. It's, I'd say it's a very autistic obsession, but it's also a very white obsession. Yeah, I was wondering why, what you meant by that, because I feel like I'm a weirdo. Like, I, mm -hmm. I want to know and understand and figure things out. And, like, to, to just label it as, like, autistic people um, being sort of um, uniquely drawn to this, I, I think maybe you're wrong, but you, you did it, you did added that addendum, uh, the white race, uh, the Aryan man, the European man. Uh, that's something mm -hmm. we're concerned or something in, on our mind. And mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of wonder about that, Spaz, because we're very different people, but I see us both kind of wanting to understand, wanting to know, mm -hmm. wanting to figure it out. And that I think that's kind of what I like about maybe people in, you know, the AN crowd, um, Danny Shine, people like yourself. Is that, is that right, Danny Shine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, 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 I, and I probably disagree with a lot of what he says, but just wanting to figure the fucking figure this fucking out. You know, part of me, mm -hmm. 
like when I was young, like I remember hearing about cancer all on the news and I'm like, well, what is cancer? And why can't we figure this out here? Here I'm 20 years, 30 years later, and we still have cancer in our society. So I'm just, mm. I don't know. I've always been drawn to truth and I don't think it's uniquely um, linked to autism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, autistic people certainly have a servile devotion to it more so than anyone else, even when it puts themselves at risk uh, to their own detriment. Um, and uh, it has been expressed before this belief that um, uh, better to know the, the awful truth than to, to live in blissful ignorance, you know. And you can say, well, on a personal level, maybe the, the blissfully ignorant are better off. Yes, you can say that. But then they, in their blissful ignorance, are going to procreate and could create more people like me. Because you have to remember, antinatalism, although it might have some genetic components to it, it is mostly a mimetic phenomenon because every single one of us who is alive comes from an unbroken chain of ancestors who were all, for whatever reason, pronatal and, if you want to call it that, successful at the game of life. Uh, well, I think I'm about wrapped up for today. Would you like to come back and have another conversation, uh, Spaz? Yeah, in a few weeks, perhaps. Um, maybe one of your friends might choose to come on here. Join in, yeah. Maybe I can get one of my my co-hosts to join in on some of this discussion. Um, uh, I think I heard you state that your favorite film villain is um, from the Indi Indiana Jones film. Is that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I never watched Indiana Jones, mm -hmm. and I never liked James Bond. Mm -hmm. And I know Richard Spencer; he's like a big fan of both. And I, I just haven't mm -hmm. been able to like find myself to to come to you know to to, to get myself to watch the Indi Indiana Jones series. I don't know, something something's mm -hmm. off putting. Something there. The I, I don't know. Don't judge a book by its cover. But I never watched these films, or mm -hmm. I, I did watch mm -hmm. some James Bond. But I, I don't like mm -hmm. James Bond. I don't really care to even want to watch Indiana Jones, but he mm -hmm. that's your favorite villain in, in, in film. So mm -hmm. maybe I should maybe I should check that out. <laughs> mm. Well, um, it's, it's mostly because I, I like the actor. I've seen him in a few other things. He's a, has a very unique uh, physiognomy, a little bit similar to my own. Um. Oh, okay. So it's like part of you sees yourself, maybe a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. I, I know you mentioned. Um, well, well, what I was saying, I, I, I like, I really like Richard Spencer. I know he's kind of a, mm. a pariah and the dissident right nowadays, but mm. I, I, I think he's interesting, and I like to, I like listening to interesting people, like Hell by mm. the Dashboard Light, and some mm. of these other people on the internet are I find very interesting, intriguing. Have have something, um, you know, have things that you don't, I don't know, um, fresh hot takes. I, I, I don't. Uh, I guess I, I'm bringing up movies because, you know, you you had mentioned Fallen. You want us, mm -hmm. you know, you wanted to have me and Pat talk about the movie Fallen, and we will do that. Um, eventually. Yeah, eventually, and it's just funny because I I really like Richard Spencer, and I think you've got some interesting things to say, and this sort of reverence for Indiana Jones is maybe making me realize I should go and watch these 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 this this genre uh, this. You know, You've what? never seen them. I, I haven't watched any of them. Really? So I. But you're, I but, you're, but you're older than I am, aren't you? Yeah, I'm. I'm almost forty. And, oh. Uh, I'll, I'll have to. I'm a film buff, so maybe I should. I, I don't know. James Bond, Indiana Jones, not my cup of tea, but maybe I'll have to mm -hmm. maybe take a second look. Um, yeah, yeah. You suggested Fallen, and uh, me and Pat will will gladly. Um, eventually, we'll get to that review. Um. Mm -hmm. Do you have do you have any other films you'd like to see uh, me and Pat review? I'm just curious. Hmm. A specific one? Um 
maybe Watership Down. Watership Down. I don't think mm. I've heard of that. That's a British film from the 70s, um, late 70s. It was, um, it, it, uh, it's it's an animated film um, centered around these uh, anthropomorphized rabbits. Um, I say anthropomorphized, they are still very much rabbits, but they talk, you know, and express thoughts like people do, you know. Um, and then I think uh, one thing a lot of the dissident right would say about the film and the book that it's based on is that it is very obviously sort of, I mean, the 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 creator of the story did invent uh, invent his own language for the rabbits, which they sort of use intermittently throughout the film, a uh, language he invented called Lapine, uh, which is similar to what Tolkien did, although Tolkien invented many languages for his uh, uh, books. Um, he, but uh, in, in, in this film, I think the dissident people would say um, that Watership Town is... It contains ele elements of sort of Moses leading his people to freedom. Uh, that kind of is built on that sort of framework. And also the villain, in a way, I suppose you could see him as sort of an allegory of maybe Hitler and the Nazis. Although, you know, depending on how you look at it, I think I, I personally think he seems a lot more like um, uh, a communist leader. You know, because the, 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 in the film, the main characters, the rabbits, the um, the Warren that they're trying to escape from is very reminiscent of, like, uh, East Germany, to be honest. It won't allow them to leave, and it wants them to stay and be as, as miserable as possible. It's a very, as far as animated films go, it's probably the most disturbing I've ever seen. Uh, one scene in particular, which involves some rabbits being gassed underground and buried alive, which, I mean, I'm amazed that the film was rated, uh, I don't know how your rating system goes, but here it was rated U, it means universal, it means anyone can watch it. And after about 40 years of that being a controversial rating, they changed it to PG, <laughs> um, which I think is still a bit too mild i think it should be at least a 12 or 12a um, yeah i i've seen some animated films that were a little uh, darker than i thought they were going to be and i actually mm -hmm. valued that i appreciated that but it wasn't maybe good for the kids if you make if that makes sense oh yeah 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 i mean they're, they're you know i can be quite sentimental i mean there are some films i can't get through without shedding a tear you know um like uh, some films from my childhood Surprisingly, not Bambi. I think I've only ever seen that once. I don't remember much about it. Um, films that have made me tear up. Um, Land Before Time. I remember that one. Very sad. It's funny you mention that. I watched oh. both Bambi and Land Before Time growing up. <laughs> Man, oh, yeah. those are the old days. Yeah. And um, what was the, um, for uh, live action movies that I really strike a sentimental note with me um artificial intelligence uh which was obviously um little people understand sort of a collaborative spielberg one yeah it was sort of a collaborative effort it was a kubrick script with a spielberg directing because it was a couple of years after he died uh, yeah kubrick. i think i remember seeing that as like a teenager and i didn't it was kind of i don't know i didn't yeah. like it but i think if i go yeah. and rewatch it i probably yeah. value it more today as an older person it's it's a very muddled film, but for me, I think it succeeds just for the the ending of the film, which I think is very poignant and very, to me anyway, it um, always strikes a chord. Um, I think for just raw emotional power, um, I'd have to say The Sixth Sense is possibly the saddest film I've ever watched. Yeah, I'm, I'm drawn to... To, to noir i'm drawn to despair mm -hmm. I'm, I'm drawn to drama mm -hmm. i actually don't like fun films yeah well um, i think i mean fallen maybe I'm, maybe I'm is, <laughs> fallen is i suppose there's some sort of noir elements to it i mean it's a 
um, sort of a um, well, I mean, it, it's not as noir as say Seven, but Seven I don't think is a very good movie. I mean, it's well shot, but um, the story and the acting I don't particularly care for. Um, and some people accuse Fallen of being cast in the same sort of mould as Seven, which, you know, maybe it is, but I think it does it much more successfully. And, of course, you know, obviously the charisma of Denzel Washington in the leading role, I mean, he's good in anything that he's in. Um, some people felt he kind of... Oh, I actually saw one review, which, one, one review which said they thought that he kind of um, sort of stone-faced the... the the performance in fall and they didn't put much into it but you know if that's if that's what he is on on low effort then even that is impressive you know because he's just a very likable the character in the film especially is very likable and um relatable and uh john and he plays off so well against uh, john goodman as his detective partner um yeah, it's uh, yeah. Well, uh, me and Pat, we'll do that. Yeah, Pat and I, we'll we'll talk about Fallen in the in the coming weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm about done here, uh, Spaz. Mm -hmm. I've I've enjoyed your company. Um, it, it's been a good chat. I, you know what? Actually, I want to ask you one more question, and then we'll shut the stream down. Mm -hmm. Is there anything from Benatar that sticks out with you that you disagree with? From his writings or or uh, talks. Hmm. Well, in the essay, I did. Um, I noted one or two things. I think they pertain to abortion, which I felt, although I thought Benatar was correct in what he says, I felt like he needed to explain a little more because I felt like there were a few loopholes there, a few things that were unresolved or he wasn't clear on. Um, but ben, with regard to abortion, Benatar takes, you know, in, in a rare moment of levity, whether it's appropriate or not, he, he describes his position as being pro death. So, yeah, that sounds grim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, Spaz, I, uh, I've enjoyed this conversation and I'm going to read and watch some more anti-natalist stuff, not because mm -hmm. I'm in love with it, but I, I just, yeah. wanna, you know, look into it. And it's something that you've kind of turned my eye to. And some of these yeah. channels have some pretty good content um, about wildlife yeah. and nature. Yeah. Um, Re regarding um, anything Benatar may have said, I, I, I disagree with outright. Um, I can't really think of anything, although I will say because he's a vegan and he's, you know, has a perhaps a very um, anthropomorphic view of animal suffering. Um, he was quick to attribute the COVID scamdemic um, to the human abuse of animals, you know, because what was it in the early days they were saying it was coming from bat soup or something? I don't know. God knows what. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I think I remember yeah. that. And Benatar... Wasted no time, I think, in um, chilling, yeah, the whole, yeah. chilling the whole animal rights uh, activist angle on that. Um, he hasn't really said anything about it more recently. I think maybe uh, once it's died down, perhaps some people who were deeply into it realized what an embarrassment it was. Yeah, I never bought into into the the shit the, the yeah. poke. I, yeah. I never bought into it. I never got. I never got uh, the poke. I never got any. Um, I never got any boosters. I never changed any way of how I live my life. I instinctually knew that it was bullshit and a mechanism yeah. for control and power over the population. Yeah. And anybody yeah. who disagrees, you're just a fucking idiot. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, my mother and I. I mean, we were quite scared for the first couple of months, but eventually, I sort of, I realized that I thought, you know. Once I stopped and looked out the window and saw the metaphorical tumbleweed, I realized, you know, nothing's actually happening. There's sod all going on. Um, it's just people running around saying the sky is falling, you know. Um, uh, I was I came out at first. I had to sort of coax my mother out of it. But once she came out of the worry and the hysteria, 
she was actually a very enthusiastic convert. In fact, now there's nothing she won't blame Bill Gates for. <laughs> I don't know. I'm I, not sure I, I think I'm not I think sure that's it, healthy yeah, either. I think that the pendulum has swung a bit too far in the opposite Yeah, degree. maybe, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. Spaz, I think we're we're done here. Um, concluding final remark. I'll make it quick, and I'm going to end the stream. And by the way, real quick, I, I've enjoyed uh, this discussion and you're welcome to, we can do mm -hmm. another stream and anybody who's interested in antinatalism, check out Do Not Watch YouTube channel. That's Do Not Watch YouTube channel. And Danny Shine, um, I forget his channel. What's his channel? Social Experimentalist. All one yeah, word. Um, check out Social Experimentalist, uh, Danny mm -hmm. Shine on YouTube if you guys are interested yeah. in antinatalism. And then uh, Spaz, mm -hmm. go ahead, give us your final remark, and we'll shut the stream mm -hmm. down. I was just trying to think of any other channels that you might want to check out. Um, I know that there's one called Life Sucks, uh, which is pretty much what it says on the tin, uh, an antinatal channel. Um, Although he's quite soft spoken and you know he's not a egotistical character, you know. Um, who else can I think of? Um, oh, don't worry about it. Yeah, uh, there are some more. I can't. If you just yeah, type in YouTube antinatalist. Um, do not watch uh, Danny Shine. There's a bunch of them out there. Um, so yeah, ch check. I mean, it's worth. I don't know. I want to, I want to, you know, understand where people are coming from and the antinatalists. I, I'm not, I'm not trying to hate on them. I'm not trying to worship or, 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 um, you know, I'm not trying to, um, support them necessarily. I just think it's an interesting subject matter. And, uh, yeah. So Spaz, why don't you, if you have any uh, final quote, final comment, um, I'll, and I'll, I'll end the stream. Um, I think. Well, I did write a brief poem uh, about my life. Yeah, why don't you read it and then we'll we'll, we'll shut her down. Okay, let's see. Got it on my clipboard here somewhere. Um, let me see. It's a bit um dour. Well, hopefully you can make it quick because we gotta sh we gotta I gotta get going here pretty quick. Okay, because see, my my mother does uh, poetry. She's got some of her poetry published. You see, and she, for a long time she was saying you should try Simon. I know you'd be good at it if you gave it a try. And I've never done poetry before, so um, she she said, well, I'll give you a few days and just come up with something, anything you like. You know, it doesn't have to be very long. Just, uh, just see what you can do. And so I wrote this, and um, I gave it to her, and she was crying when she read it. And I said, well, "What else the matter?" And she said, "Well, I didn't expect you to give me something like this. This is really, you know." She was just in floods of tears. You gonna read it? Yeah. Oh, I was waiting for you to say something. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, okay. My life is a nightmare. I cannot wake. I regret my birth. That dreadful mistake. The hurt I try so hard to hide, betrayed by the tears welling up in my eyes. It is such a weight. The burden I bear. How I envy those fools without a care. I feel the warm stream down my face. This agony time can't erase. It is so immense the pain that I feel from an open wound that will never heal. Consumed by anger, guilt and fear. As the wound grows, I disappear. Bro. Whoa. <laughs> that's, a, that's rough. Yeah. All right, well, Spaz. Uh, 
Well, let's it's have a, let's have another. Uh, we'll we'll reconvene. We'll have another discussion. I, I have got to do a little more research. Um, you know, develop some more questions for you. Um, it's been an interesting discussion, and I, you know, I, I, you know, you're one of my listeners. You've been in my comments, you know, comments, um, you know, in my comments and my live chat. So, you know, I, I'm willing to talk to people, um, express ideas. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, um, people want to preach. People want to, you know, express themselves. Mm -hmm. And I'm very open to you know, um, having dialogue with my, my listeners, my subscribers. So if anybody wants to, um, you know, do a stream or, or wants to have a discussion or a talk, I'm open to it. And, uh, I, I've enjoyed, you know, this discussion spaz and well, let's do another one. All right, man. Yeah. I did also have a, another, because of the success of that one in my mother's view anyway. Um, I, was doing another poem, a much longer one about. Uh, you know about, what? Um, you know what's best? Save it for our next stream, okay? Maybe. Yeah. Oh, I, I wasn't. I wasn't going to read it because it's too long and it's not finished. But I was going to say it's a, a little bit more upbeat, I suppose, because it's a, a poem about a man who, fights a tyrannical god and, succeeds in, uh, dethroning him. Very good. Um. Yeah, Spaz, uh, Autisticus Spasticus. I, I really appreciate you coming on the channel. I, it was a good talk, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. we'll probably do another one, okay? Yeah. For the next few weeks, I'm going to be recuperating from my illness. All righty. Well, we'll keep in touch, and we'll do it again, okay, bud? All right, then. You have a good night. Okay.